So yesterday you encountered a few problems, you should have anyway, where uh, you have the special cases. Now this is, you shouldn't have to copy this down, this is still off our note page from yesterday. Okay, it's the bottom part, it's part four there, we have your special cases. So if you recall this, um, what happens when B is zero? Well, if B is zero, recall, you can just solve for x squared. There's only one x in there, so you just uh, isolate x. You get x by itself. So adding 4, you get 3x squared equals 4. Divide both sides by 3. Okay, you get x squared equals 4 thirds. And then taking the square root, you get x equals plus minus the square root of 4 thirds. Now we can't leave it in that format, right? We're, we're not going to leave a fraction inside a radical like that. So that becomes root 4 over root 3, which root 4 is easy. That's 2 over root 3. Don't, don't drop your plus minus as you're going through this. Okay, And then to get that radical out of the denominator, multiply by that special number 1 that we talked about in the past. That's a value of 1. It's just in a different form, that number over itself. So it gives you 2 root 3 over 3. Okay. Thank you. 2 root 3 over 3, and then you have that plus minus. Okay. Any questions on that process there? Dylan? So um, for the plus minus, does it, would it go with the whole thing, or does it just go with where the, um, the square root is? It's the whole, pro the whole, this whole, uh, this whole number is a positive. So you have the positive 2 root 3 over 3, and you have negative 2 root 3 over 3. Those are your two solutions. Okay, any other questions there? All right, remember, this represents x-intercepts, right? So everyone on your calculator right now, calculate 2 root 3 over 3. Let's go out to the nearest tenth on it. One point two. Okay, so a couple, two of you said 1.2, so that means you have positive 1.2 and you have negative 1.2. That's what the plus minus means, right? It means my graph is going to cross there and there on the x-axis. Okay, we know it's a equals, a is 3, so it's a positive, so it's, it's going to go down and it's going to have a y-intercept of negative 4 is going to hit somewhere down here. That's actually my vertex, okay, because the B term's not there, so it doesn't shift left or right. It's something like that. Yesterday, by the way, when we were in here, I said our y-intercept was like 3, and it was actually not 3, because I forgot to double it. It's supposed to be 6, but anyway, that's on the video lesson. No one caught that, but I caught myself after I taught it a second time. It wasn't a big deal, but there we got it. Okay, recall, that's what that means. Dylan, catch that? Yeah. Okay, I don't want you guys to just, uh, the problem that you're going to have in math, especially because it becomes so abstract for you, you don't apply this every day, the problem you're going to have is you're going to just start remembering rules. You're like, oh yeah, I take the root, every time I do that, I, I put a plus minus. Understand what that means. I mean, plus minus means you have a positive intercept and a negative intercept. It doesn't just mean, yeah, we do plus minus, okay? Try to relate everything you're doing back to your picture. Try to tie all this stuff together so you're remembering file folder. Like, remember what I talked about earlier in the year, you're learning 13 or 14 different graphing patterns. You want to learn them as chunks. That way you're learning 13 or 14 different things versus 13 or 14 different graphing patterns, and each one of those has like seven rules involved with them. So now you have 13 times seven things you're learning. Okay? Or if you can chunk that stuff together and put it in a little box in your memory or a file folder in your memory, it'll help you out. That's why we do those summary pages on our portfolio pages. 
Okay. Any questions there? All right. Let's move on here. Um, the next one, what happens when C is zero? So in other words, what happens when you have binomials, where you only have two terms, when B is zero or C is zero? Well, if C is zero, recall from yesterday, we talked about taking out a greatest common factor. What comes out of both of those? X, X does. What times X makes 7X squared? 7X. 7X. And what times X makes 5X? Negative 5. Negative 5. You have now factored it, and the goal is for us to find two things, like this x times this 7x minus 5 equals 0. One of those two things has to be 0. Well, what makes x 0? Anytime you pull out an x, one of your answers is going to be 0. Okay. What makes x 0? 0 does. What makes 7x minus 5 equals 0? You add 5, divide by 7 to solve that. So I assume you can do that in your head. It becomes 5 7 So my two, two solutions are x equals 0 and 5 7 So again, those are the two x-intercepts. That's where it crosses your x-axis. OK, so those are special cases. What would happen if you had this? Well, we could distribute, and then we'd have to factor, right, yeah. to solve. But it's already factored for us. Would you have to distribute and then subtract the 18 and then factor? You could, yeah. yeah so, but it's in a factored, I mean, you're right. It's not in a factored form where it equals 0. But this part is in a factored form, right? Okay, so rather than distributing, remember earlier we kind of we talked about another way of getting rid of that two there, that power. Yeah, let's take that root. Okay, so let's take the square root and make it a little easier. If I can unlock it by just taking the square root, that now gives me that. What's my next step to get x by itself? Add two. Okay, and I, I said that you should write it like that earlier. I think that'll make it a little easier to understand. But Hannah's right. You could actually do FOIL here, and then you could move the 18 and then factor it again. You could try that. And sometimes that won't work. But in this case right here, I, I'm looking at this and I go, well, root 18 isn't a perfect root. Okay? So to actually simplify that, root 18 is root 9 by root 2. So that becomes 3 root 2 plus minus 2. Okay, that's what x equals. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means you'd have to take x plus 3 root 2 and x or excuse me, 2 plus 3 root 2 and 2 minus 3 root 2. That's 2, no, 3. Those are my two solutions. Now those are hard to visualize what those are on your y or your x-axis right now until you actually were to calculate your x-intercepts. You'd have to actually figure out what that is, maybe the nearest tenth. So this problem couldn't be factored. If, you, if we would have multiplied it out, we couldn't have factored that. I know that because I'm not getting whole numbers or integers here. I'm not getting integers as my answers. Yeah? So on the homework for number 1 through 15, yeah. do we really need to show the work for like 1 through 5, or it's just you have to just add, or for in the parentheses, you have to add one over the other side? Is that your solution? Uh, on, are you talking like number 8? Or? Yeah. You don't have to do that, no. If you if you factor, like number two here, factors to x plus 5, or excuse me, x plus, plus uh, what do you got here? X, yeah, x minus 5, x minus 2. Thank you. Okay, 
I don't need to see I don't need to see you actually write out x minus 5 equals 0. I just assume you know that, that one, this answer is 5 and this answer is 2. Okay? Because that's what makes that 0. We practiced that enough in here that you should be able to do that in your head now. But you, you need to write it in the, a, a good format, right? 2, 5. Okay? Other questions there? Okay. So we have our special cases. Hopefully that helps you out. The next thing I want you to give a shot to right now is I gave you a piece of graph paper on the way in. I want you to graph that equation. Okay, find the zeros for x. Okay, putting it in standard form first is helpful. I am then going to factor that. I'm going to pull that 2 out. Okay, so if I pull a 2 out of there, that gives me Okay, now if I want to graph that, I, I could go 2 times, I, I could try to factor that first. Okay, if I factor that out, 2 things to multiply to make 10 and add to 21 it work? Or excuse me, multiply to make 21 and add to 10. Okay, and all that stuff equals 0. Alright, so what I have now are these x-intercepts of 3 and 7. What about the 2 on the outside of the 5? It's not going to affect an x-intercept, right? Because there's no way to make, that's a good question, you can't make 2 equal 0. So either that has to be 0, this has to be 0, or this has to be 0. Is it kind of just reminding you what you um, reduced it by? Yeah, well, I mean, it, you still have to make it equivalent to this. So we still have to have the 2 out there. But when we're going here, 1, 2, 3, right there, and 4, 5, 6, 7, right there, those are my intercepts. Yeah. I could. I could tell you my axis of symmetry based on my intercepts. Can everyone see it there? Your intercepts split your parabola in half. Okay. There's my axis of symmetry, meaning my x value of my vertex is at 5. Okay, so you have a couple ways you can do it. You can do the opposite of b over 2a to find the 5, or you can just do that. Okay, but once you have 5, you can plug that back in up here. Right? That's 25 minus 50, which is negative 25 plus 21. Okay, negative 4 times 2. Oh, it's not that. It's the answer is negative 4. Huh? The answer is negative 4? So 25 minus 50, that's negative 25, plus 21 is negative 4 times 2. Times 2, negative 8, yeah. Okay, so we'd be down here at negative 8. We know from our A term, we know from our A term, this is still our A, we go over 1 and up 2. Over 1 and up 2. Over 2 and up 4 times 2 or 8. Hey, we hit those points. Okay? Over 3 and up 3, or excuse me, 9 times 2, which is 18, which brings me all the way to the tippy top. It's almost like I planned that. Okay? And then you've got your parabola. Okay, so that's another way that the intercepts can help us out. Notice that the number 0 and y are interchangeable in this. Okay, if this says y equals here, we put the 0 in, we let y become 0 so that we can find the x-intercepts. The x-intercepts is when y is 0. That's why those become interchangeable. Okay, hopefully you're tying this stuff together. Any questions there? Okay, a real quick note. Gabby, can I see your paper again?
Okay, I'm handing these back, and almost everyone has corrections. There's like only four of you that don't have corrections. Um, Gabby has very few corrections here, but I want to point out this is Gabby's page. Now, there are about five or ten of you, well, maybe five of you that have actually done this. This is a portfolio page. This is your note page. Every little thing that you think you should put in here for parabolas should be on this page. You get to use this on your final if your portfolio is cleared. You'll get to use it next year. You'll get to use it when you're in college. I talked to one of my former students that's now done two years of college. He said, man, I'm done with math. McCoy, I, he's doing some kind of goofy writing thing. I don't know. but I'm just joking. Writing's fine. But anyway, he, he's like, I'm done with math. And he's a good student. He goes, I used my portfolio all through college. Every class I used it at some point. Okay, I'm not pumping. I like if you don't use them, that's fine. That's up to you. But you should put notes on these. Some of you are really good at this. I was looking at your notes, and I want to like put big stars on them. Like, dude, that's awesome. You got good notes. Some of you don't have anything. Like, you don't even have you don't even have your work shown for this. I mean, dude. Okay, show your work. It's only going to benefit you. All right, one other thing, and I'm going to use Gabby's here because a lot of you did this. I need to know what I, your labels are here. Okay, now you'll, you'll look at Gabby's, you're like, well, dude, she labeled it. Come on, McCoy, are you, like, what's wrong with you? Okay, well, I don't know if this is x squared or if this is x. I don't, I need to know what each part of this graph is when I say labels. And the reason, like, it may not make as much sense to you. But I know what chapter 6 brings, and it brings some goofy looking graphs, man. You're doing like crazy all over the place stuff. So you need to make sure that you're labeling each part. Gabby, I appreciate you letting me use that. That's really good. Okay, so if, you're, if you haven't put notes on yours, I would do that. I mean, if I, even if I've checked it off, I would do that with all of them. Linear, absolute value, everything. And don't wait till the end of the semester when you've forgotten everything. Okay? Right? You're not. How many are you using your absolute value graphs every day? Yeah, yeah exactly. So you, you're you want to you want to have good notes so you can refresh your memory quickly. Okay, and your best notes will be your own handwriting. All right. There you go. Give that one a go. Last one. So in this one right here, when I put it in standard form, five x squared plus four x minus twelve equals zero. Can I factor? No, 5 times negative 12 is negative 60. Two things that multiply to make negative 60 and add to 4. And you go through it, 1 and 60 doesn't work. 2 and, two and 30, 3 and 10, 4 and 15, 3 and 12, excuse me, thank you. 3 and, huh? Oh, 20, my goodness. 3 and 20, 4 and 15, 5 and 12, none of those work. 6 and 10. Oh, 6 and 10. Hey, does that one work? Yeah. Oh, dude. All right. Okay, we got 5 times, and then we got 6 times 10. Which one's which? Negative 6, positive 10. Negative 6, positive 10. Hey, all right. Well, cool. So if we go negative 6 and positive 10, and we divide by A, that's our 5. That gives us, that doesn't reduce. That gives us two. two. So we now have 5x minus 6 times x plus 2. Do our quick check. Negative 6 times 2 is negative 12. 5x times x is 5x squared. Negative 6x and positive 10. That gives us positive 4x. We are good. This gives me negative 2 and positive 6 fifths as my zeros. Okay, so that's an awful lot. So what are zeros? Well, we've got it. x equals 6 fifths and negative 2. What makes this graph more difficult to deal with? Well, yeah, I mean, you have 6 fifths. It's like, okay, that's like right there-ish. That's a little tougher. Okay? And we could still do it. 
How do we do this on our graphing calculator? Well, that's kind of what I want to point out. So if you don't have your graphing calculator, if you don't have one, you need to borrow one. I want you to put this on your graphing calculator. We put in our, our in standard form, 5x squared plus 4x minus 12. And we hit graph. And when we graph it, we get that. Now, we've talked about calculating zeros in here. Okay. If you're dealing with your graphs, you're using this top row, and I want to calculate my zeros. I want to find where it crosses. I know we know the answers right now. But just a quick review, and this recording this, so then you can always look back at it. You go to second calc, and what am I calculating? Zero. Zero. Option two. And then it says left bound. And you'll notice when I start moving my cursor over, I'm pointing to the left. I need it to get left bound. You can start seeing that little spider looking thing. If that scares you, then we would just call it a cursor. Okay, or frogger, maybe. Okay, you start seeing that move. We want to the left of this zero right here. Okay, well, to the left of that, as you're reading a graph from left to right, the left of that is up here. Notice the further we go, we're going to the right. So left bound means above that zero. We hit enter. Right bound means below that zero to get. So we have to now go below that zero. And we hit enter. And it says guess, since there are two zeros, we need the zero or the cursor to be closest to the zero we're trying to calculate. So right now it is. It's closer to this zero than to that one. So we could just hit enter. And it tells me that zero is negative two, just like we knew. Okay. We go to second calc, we find the next zero. Now left bound of that one, we move our cursor until we see it appear. Left bound is below this zero, right? The further we go um, downward, the further left we go. So we hit enter. Right bound would be above that zero because that's to the right of it on the graph. And we hit enter. And then a guess means we just need to be closer to that zero than that zero, which we are. We hit enter, and it says 1.2. Was well, 6 fifths 1.2? Yeah. yeah, it is. So we're good. OK. You could also use your table feature. If you use second table, what are you looking for when you're looking for zeros for x? Yeah, when y is 0, that gives you your x-intercepts. There's one of them. You'll notice I don't see the 1.2 because I'm not going up by that here. So if you're like, well, I can't see it, you could always go into second table set and say, well, maybe I want to go up by, right now we know it's 0.2, but maybe you have to change your interval there. You go up by 0.2, and now we could actually find that 1.2 on there. Okay, it takes a little longer. There's the negative 2. Okay, and there's our 1.2. All right. Any questions there? Just re little reviews. Okay. Your assignment today, take a look. Oh, while you're doing that, just remember you have this page. That's your note page, all that stuff we've covered. Your assignment today is going to be the mixed side. You guys want all? No. Oh, that's insane. I'll pass all you guys are making me making me thankful to be a math teacher. You want all that? That's awesome. All right. Let's go with six through thirty-five. Okay. Six through thirty-five. That's your assignment. Some of those are easy. They only have two terms. Some are tougher. You're going to get better at factoring, though, I'll tell you that. Okay, it'll be due on Monday when you come back. Okay?